and the recording is on. So welcome to SQL Friday. This is SQL Friday number 93. And uh, we have uh, Malam, I hope I pronounced your last name, Mahadevan, correctly? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Good. And uh, Mala is going to talk about, uh, well, I, I think, detecting code smells in T-SQL with Scriptom, finding T-SQL anti-patterns with Scriptom. Uh, it's Mala's first time on SQL Friday. I'm really happy to have you here, Mala. Thank you. The stage is all yours. And if anyone has questions, just type them in the chat and I will relay them to, to Mala. Yeah, you can stop me um, as I go along uh, if anybody wants to know more about anything. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Magnus and SQL Friday for having me. Uh, my topic for today is uh, finding T-SQL anti-patterns with a little known tool called Script Dog. So this is a little bit about me. I've been in the SQL community and working on SQL Server since 1996, and I have a few things to my credit. Um, I can be found on Twitter as SQLMAL. If you need to reach me, I also have a blog at curiousaboutdata.com. So what are the takeaways from today's presentation? We are going to understand what is this little known tool, um, you know, how long has it been around and uh, why do we think it's useful? And then we are going to look at how we are going to use PowerShell to identify some of the common uh, code smells or anti-patterns uh, as we call them. And then how we can also use it to fix some of these um, anti-patterns. Uh, we are also going to learn about the pros and cons of this tool. What are scenarios under which it's useful and what are some scenarios under which it might not be the optimal choice? Before we get started with what exactly is uh, Scriptom, let's let's take a brief look at what what do we mean by anti-patterns or what do we want these code smells to be. Anti-patterns in general is a term that is referred to something that has been in use for a long time and it's actually there for a certain purpose, but it, it leads to other problems. And usually most anti-patterns are practiced frequently and they have a certain use case. They have legitimate use cases. Take, for example, select star. Select star, if you use it all over the place, we know it can return a lot of stuff that is not needed. It can lead to a lot of extra traffic and it is, you know, it's it's bad practice. But select star does have its place. Like if you do an if exists with a select star or if you're selecting from, say, a temp table and such, you know, it doesn't really hurt anything. So it has its legitimate use cases. And it's practiced pretty frequently. The only problem is that if you start to do it as a general practice, it can lead to other problems. So these are these are the things that we call anti-patterns. And in the T-SQL world, there is a huge number of anti-patterns. And I have listed a few of them here uh, that are commonly found. There are many, many more, but these are what, you know, these are some of them that we are going to be looking at today as examples. So what are the options that we to find anti-patterns in today's world? So there are some ways we can go about this. We can use a text-based search um, a lot of times, you know, in places where they don't think a, a linting or a, a code smell tool is necessary. We use a text-based search. I used to do this quite a lot. Uh, we can use regex if you are smart enough or if you have people who are really smart who can write regex patterns to find uh, stuff, you can do that. Uh, there are a huge number of third party tools, many open source based tools that you can go find, you know, on GitHub or in other places to do the same thing. Uh, and lastly, if you have like me, if you work in a shop where none of these options are good enough, um, no third party tool can provide the kind of rules that that are needed by your special environment, then you come to what is called script doc. And this is not a ready-made tool. This is a tool that you can use to write your own linter or to find, you know, um, make it find the kind of anti-patterns that you want to find. So let's look at the pros and cons of each of these approaches. Now, with a text-based search, we know what is what is normally the problem. You can find all sorts of stuff. You can find stuff in comments. You can find stuff that, you know, some kind of a 
code that somebody wrote but is not currently in use. All kinds of stuff. No, no text based search is highly unreliable and it's not going to give you details of where it found what and how and all of that. All of that requires all sorts of coding around it. Um, it's going to be inaccurate. Regex, you know, regex is really complex to construct and know what one person constructs may not be quite, uh, you know, understandable to somebody else. And you need to construct multiple constructs for every scenario you find you need to write a different regex pattern. It gets to be just too much work, too cumbersome. Third party tools, yeah, just like I said in the earlier slide, if you have specific needs, then it's hard to find a third party tool that meets all your needs. Sure, you can fork somebody's code and make changes to it, but even that it may be hard to do if you have a lot of things that are very special to your own environment. Uh, DMVs, you can use DMVs to find a lot of stuff, like for example, especially in objects and not, not in code, especially in tables and indexes and such. Um, if you have a set option in an index that is missing, like a data card, Or find it. The problem with DMVs, though, that is that it can only find stuff after you've deployed, after you've actually created the object. What if you want to be proactive? You want to be a proactive DBA. You want to find, you know, an index that somebody's trying to roll out without the right options on it. You want to find that before that thing gets deployed, because you know after it gets deployed, then it can get to be uh, a little hard to fix. You know, depending on the problem, it can get to be hard to fix uh, without a downtime or without creating some issues. So DMVs cannot help you there. That is, they cannot sift through, you know, code that is not deployed and uh, tell you what is missing. So this is some of the issues with DMVs. So that brings us to what uh, the tool or that I'm going to be talking about today, which is script DOM. Script DOM is very useful to find problems before objects are actually created. It is a scientific method. It's not going to give you false positives like your text text-based search or maybe even a regex can do. Uh, it's version compatible because it's created by Microsoft specifically for this purpose. And it is, um, you have one version of the library for every version of SQL Server that's out there. So you don't have to make your code, you know, backward or forward compatible and make changes to it. Uh, depending on that, it comes with its own version of that. So all that said, let's look at what exactly this is. Scriptdom essentially it's a DLL. It's a library that that is um, short for T SQL script document object model. This was uh, created by a gentleman named Gert Brepers. Uh, those of you all who have been uh, familiar with the Microsoft world for a long time who've been MVPs, you may have definitely heard of his name. Um, he's still with them and he was the person. Um, it was used internally by Microsoft since 2008. So it's been around for a very long time. But God Drapers was the person who decided to make it publicly available and release it along with SQL Server. Since 2012, it's been released along with SQL Server. It used to be part of the .NET Framework library. And currently, uh, the way they have um, packaged it is it is part of the DACFX package. And there is a new version that is released every time there is uh, a new version of SQL Server that goes out. So what can a script DOM do this? is actually like a Swiss Army knife and it cannot, it doesn't stop with just doing linting or finding uh, anti-patterns for you. It can do a bunch of stuff. So it can parse your T-SQL scripts and tell you if there are any parsing errors that you have. This is very useful if you have large volumes of uh, code, especially older code that you don't know whether or not this is going to work somewhere and it's too risky for you to deploy and find out. So it can parse those scripts and tell you, OK, this is a, you have syntax errors or this this particular whatever you have used here. This is not going to work with the version of your choice. So this sort of stuff it can do really easily. Um, it can format T SQL scripts according to some general standards. We'll see what those standards are. Um, it can find anti-patterns in your code and also it can fix some anti-patterns, not all of them, but it can fix some of them. So these are some of the things that we are going to look at with script DOM today. So when is it most useful? It's useful, like I said, if you have a really large code base because the effort involved to create this linting tool with, with script DOM, I wouldn't say it's very hard, but it's not trivial either. So you need to sink some effort in to create whatever linting, uh, you know, scripts that you want. And uh, 
the value add comes if you have a really large T SQL code base that you can run it off of. If you have a lot of legacy code, if you have old versions of SQL Server, um, not older than 2008, but <laughs> at least up to that point, um, if you have something and you want to you know, run rules on it, uh, then it's very useful. Um, you want to find, oh crap, you want to find issues before it's deployed, not, not after. So that's, that's where that's where it comes in handy. And then you do not want any more stress on servers finding them. That is, uh, you don't want to actually run big large queries on your database and add to whatever you're having right there uh, by way of finding bottles. So these are some of the scenarios under which you can find uh, script DOM really useful. Um, installing the script DOM, it's really, really easy. You can go to the link for uh, DACFX. Uh, then I share my slide deck. You know, you'll find the, the URL right there. You can go and uh, install it from there. Um, it comes with separate versions for .NET Core and .NET Framework. The one I'm going to be using for demos is .NET Framework based. Um, all you need is this one DLL here. That is, uh, that's uh, the path. Uh, like I said, 150. I'm using SQL Server 2017, so it's 150 for me. Depending on what you're using, um, it'll put it there. So you can just grab that one DLL. That's literally all. You can copy it and to wherever you want to run the scripts from, and that's literally all you need. There's no other dependencies or anything else that it that it expects, and it absolutely does not need you to have a SQL Server installed to go with it. Oh, so look, let's look at the basic structure of this DLL. So the namespace is is like that. What you have there, it's a very, very large namespace. It has well over a thousand classes. Um, some of the important classes are the parser. Like I said, this is what helps you parse the code and lets you know whether or not it's syntactically correct. Again, I want to emphasize that this parsing is only for syntactical correctness and because you're not, correct, you're not connected to any active SQL server in this process, it's not going to validate your objects for you. It's not going to tell you if that table doesn't exist or this column is missing in a view or this sort of thing. It cannot tell you all that because it's not connected to any SQL server. It can just parse, uh, it can do whatever the parsing does on SSMS. Let's say that, that green check that you tick before you run your code, that's what it does. That's the same thing that happens behind the scenes, by the way, that's what it uses here. So here, yeah. and then what the parser creates the output is the T-SQL fragment, which is an abstract class, and it's a parent class for a lot of the other classes that we are going to see. This fragment is going to be the input for the next step, and then you have what is called a visitor, visitor pattern, which is we'll see what this, all of this sounds like a lot of a lot of jargon, but it's actually not terribly hard once you get to understand what it is. Uh, and then the script generator, script generator is what we are going to use when we use this thing to fix the problems that it finds. So, and in addition to all this, you also have individual language based statement classes that the, these are the things that we use to find specific problems. So for every problem, there is a, an equivalent uh, class like this. Uh, these are some examples, and there are literally thousands of them, uh, way too many to, to uh, even put down here. Like if you look at the depth and the width of T-SQL as a language, you can understand that too, is that how many permutations and combinations of stuff is even possible and imagine going about creating classes for all that well that's what they've done here so there are thousands of classes and uh, you know it's mind-boggling how big it is so let's let's go on and look at the demo of the parser first to begin with can you see my screen magnus i see the screen yes yeah. okay so before i show you how this works. I'm going to walk you through the code. So what I have here as input is a simple. Simple uh, stored procedure that I pulled from uh, wide world importers. And what I do below here is that I add a reference to the library, so it's in this folder for me. And then I, I create an instance of the parser object. Which is from that library, you can see that my version is SQL Server 2017, so I use the 150 parser. You can change this to whatever version of SQL Server you're using. So I create a, a parser object. Then I create a parse error object to store 
any errors that it creates. And then I'm using the string reader. It's a common PowerShell uh, construct to read, read whatever I pass, the, read the script line by line. And then it goes through the past objects. I pass whatever the output of the string reader. And if there are any errors, it's going to tell me there are some errors. Otherwise, it's going to say, you know, your code is clean. It parses fine. So let's give this a try. So it's telling me no parsing error. So how about I introduce some sort of an error? Let's say I select it. I'm going to try. So there it is telling you that it's an incorrect syntax. It's telling you where it found it to. It found it on. If I might have to move your window a bit to scroll here. Let's see. Yeah. So it's telling you line 53, which is where I put the three, column nine. And um, it's 54 here because I have a, a blank line on top, but no more or less accurate. And it's saying incorrect syntax near that line. So it found, you know, it found the syntax error and that's how that's how it works. Uh, a very simple, you know, four lines of code. And if you have a large volume of old code that you want to check for syntactical accuracy, this is pretty handy to use. Go back to the slide deck. OK, so we saw a demo of the parser. So we need to understand how the parser works and why is this necessary to understand is because we are going to be using not just the parsing component, but also certain other components. So this is actually, you know, this is not specific to script DOM. This is just how parsers work in general. So if you've been to computer school, uh, you know, you may find these terms familiar. Um, I didn't, so it was a little, uh, you know, it was a learning experience for me. So what it does is when you pass the script, uh, uh, there is something called the lexer, which creates tokens from the script. That is, it splits the script into components and each component becomes a token. And the parser actually matches the tokens to the inbuilt rules that T-SQL has. Then the syntax evaluator spits out the token that does not match the rule. So this diagram shows you how it works. The text is passed to the lexer where the lexer creates these things called tokens. And we'll see, I'll show you a demo of what tokens are to in a second. Then the tokens are passed to the parser and the parser creates what is called an abstract syntax tree, which is a tree like representation of, of your code. And this syntax tree is passed to the syntax evaluator, which has its inbuilt rules for T SQL and then it tells you whether or not your syntax is correct. If it approves, it approves like we just saw. If it doesn't approve, it doesn't approve. So to understand, uh, you know, that your tokens can be full in finding some anti patterns. So that's why I showed you this demo, the, this brief demo that it's useful to understand how the script DOM parser works. Any questions? Nothing so far, Nothing no. So, far. so we saw what it creates. What is an abstract syntax tree? An abstract syntax tree is a tree like representation of the syntax. So each node of the tree denotes a construct. <laughs> it's the output of the parser. Are you OK? <laughs> I'm OK. It was someone who wasn't muted, so it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the output of the parsers. Let's look at the diagram on the left here. If you have a if you have a T SQL code and you want to split parts of the code into a tree like structure like this. So go on top and you know you have uh, your select update the release statements. Then you have a commit and a rollback and a lock table and various things, right? So if you put your code in a tree like structure like this in a sequence of how it runs, then then it becomes what is called an abstract syntax tree. So this is kind of this is kind of the output of the parser. And this is what um, this is what happens when you when you um, allow script DOM to parse your T SQL code. So why is an abstract syntax tree needed? So that's the difference between finding things in text using a text based search and using a more intelligent method. I know this is a very common example. People may have seen it. Uh, the, the importance of the Oxford comma. So if you have no comma, then your statement can mean something totally different. 
right? A panda eats shoots and leaves, but if you put that comma there, each of that becomes a verb, and you know, you know what exactly it is referring to. So that's kind of what what an abstract syntax tree is. Is like it helps you find things in an intelligent manner, and that's exactly the reason why it is needed. So let's explore the script DOM abstract syntax tree, basic structure and how the fragment is created. And I'll show you what tokens are and how they work. So what I'm doing here is basically the same thing you saw with the parser. Um, so far, I'm not going to explain that all over again. So the only difference is that after the parser is created, what I'm going to be doing is to look at the output of the parser. So I'm going to go through each line and I'm going to what it does and things like that. And I'll show you the output in a second. So let's run this. Sorry about that. OK, so um, we ran that script and then we know it created what is called the output of that is what is the parsed objects object. So if I look at that. The hell? expand this a little bit. So what it tells you here, this is the abstract syntax tree. So it tells you that there are two back. And then this is the script token stream, which is you the. The property you see at the very end, this is what is called uh, the tokens that I said, how it how it breaks up into tokens. So the code I passed is like this, right? Use wide word importers go and then a query, simple query. So the two batches here, the first one is the use statement and the second one is the select statement. So if you go down further into this. Batch. So it tells you that it's a use statement. It's a database name and you know. That's kind of what. Dot statement type. Just one. The second, the select statement. OK, that is the use database statement and the second is select statement. So it's telling you it's a query expression and it's giving you all the components of the select statement into on. You know, if you have a CTE, then it's going to put something in the CTE. Blah, 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 all that. OK, and you can keep digging down this tree like this because. To find out all the components of the. Maybe expression. So where class group by class having class all of this, so it will keep going down like this and imagine uh, that this is just one select statement and if this tree is so deep, can you imagine how big it's going to be if you're actually going to parse, uh, you know, uh, an actual stored procedure really, really big, really complex and the amount of code you're going to need to navigate this is going to be massive, not very efficient, right? So that's why they have something what they call um, what they call a visitor class and I'll come to that in a second. But before we go there, we show you what is tokens. 
to tokenize it. Okay, I want to just show you what what a token is before we go down to this. So a token is the various components of. I have a very simple, very simple uh, select statement here, and what scriptdom does to break this down into tokens. So if we run this. Basically, what it does is it tells you what every element is like type is a single line comment. So the first line I had there, right? I have a, a comment called testing token. So it's telling me that's a that's a comment and then whether or not it's a reserved word and the location is line zero, whatever like this and then a white space and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then the text is select. And if, if you see if it's a reserved word, it's going to say. True. So like that on and on and this this is how it breaks down a select statement and how this can be useful. This can be very useful if you want to find certain things like some people have rules like all your reserved words need to be capitalized and you know if you want that kind of a rule to be implemented tokens can be very useful. They are also very useful if you want to find comments like you know you have you want a certain person's if I make a change to the code, I need to have added a comment with my name. So how do I find out if I've added a comment to my name? I you know I tokenize it and I check if my name is part of the. So these are scenarios uh, with the rules where tokenizing can be very useful and I can actually show you one example where you have you no know, I'll show it. Maybe I should keep that for later. OK, where reserved words are not uppercase. That's the most common usage of this thing. So we saw tokens and how they work. So using script DOM as a formatter, like I said, this thing is a very versatile tool. We saw how we could use it, use it to parse the code. We saw how we could find, you know, reserved words and that kind of stuff. Now we can use it as a formatter also. And I'll show you that in a second. So format is equal. So what I'm doing here is basically Showing you the options it has for formatting. So you supply an in input script and it will give you an output script and the formatter essentially. Same thing you had you add a reference to the DLL and then you add create a generator object instead of a parser object. You create a generator object because that's what you need for formatting. And like I said uh, with the. SQL thing, right? SQL uh, version. You can have 150, 130, whatever here. And then these are that you have with the formatter. There's a number of options, and all of them are fairly standard. You have you have a way of turning them on and off if you choose to. There's a number of them. I won't go go down every one of them because they're fairly common. And then you know, at the end of this. You create the generator, you create, you pass the object and you pass it to the. Once it. The, the imperative thing is that you have to, it has to be syntactically correct. You cannot format something that is syntactically incorrect. So once it once it passes the syntax text, you can pass it to the generate object and it will generate the formatted output for you. So let me look at. I'm going to unformatted proc. So I'm going to show you a proc that is not formatted. So here you have it, you know, it's jumbled up a little bit. So I have I have a lowercase creator alter and I have a begin try that is, you know, to one side and I have a select statement to another side and all of that. So this is what I'm going to pass to the. This, unformat proc and then it's going to create what is called a formatted proc. So let's see what it does. OK, let's go back there. Use uh, tortoise double purpose as a diff tool, so I show you that. So see, you can see what it does. It cleaned up all the stuff. It capitalized your creator alter, and then it, uh, you know, it aligned all these things neatly. So your uh, 
your insert is aligning with the declare and all of these things and all of these things are one one level inside all of that that looks good there are some issues with this the problem though is that it strips the code of comments this is something that i have um, opened a ticket with microsoft with and i hope they will fix it um, i really hope they will because with code this can be a big problem as you can see this code this comment here is gone so this is a this is a bug with the with the tool and this has to be fixed. This is probably not an issue if you're looking at object scripts like tables and you know various things. Um, you don't need uh, comments there, but it is a problem when you look at code. But other than that, it will do the rest of the job for you like really neatly. So it's all aligned. That's an example of formatting. Let's go back to the any questions so far. So if you're interested in using this, then uh, you know up, uh, preserve comments. Then there is a GitHub link on my slide deck. Go there and upvote it for them to fix it, please. Oh, what is that so far? And I also showed you how you can walk the abstract syntax tree if you have to find something. Um, as we saw, even for a simple statement, this tree can be pretty large and cumbersome. Um, so if you have to walk the tree programmatically to find anything, it can mean a lot of code and a lot of work. So an easier way for doing this is what is called a visitor class. So if you consider an anti-pattern or a code construct that you want to find as an apple, say, for example, then the old fashioned way of doing it without the stool or anything is sort of like this, like this person climbing a tree to pick the apple. It's a lot of effort. A lot of apples may be missed. Now, if you want to walk the abstract syntax tree programmatically, it's a little bit like that. So you you shake the tree with, with a tool. Um, you have a tool, so it's better than somebody picking by hand. But you still have the same issues. Like if you're walking the tree programmatically, your code has to take care of every every turn that it can take and you can you can miss a lot of stuff, especially in a language as with so many variants like T SQL has. It's really easy to miss stuff, so that's possible. A visitor class is more like what you have down here. It's sort of like this automatic shaker where if you shake the tree, everything falls out and chances of your missing anything are really, really low to non-existent. So the reason this tool was created was to function like that, that bottom thing, uh, although you can still use it like the one to the right hand corner out there. So a visitor class is basically it's derived from the base class, the T-SQL fragment visitor and the visit method. It has a method. The method is what happens when you encounter a type of class, like for example, a select star expression or you know, whatever else that you may want to find, like um, an index setting or uh, maybe a query hint or any such thing. So the visit method will tell you what you have to do. You, do you consider this an anti-pattern or do you want to do something else with it? So you can define what you want to do with it using the visit method. So let me show you how that works first and then. You walk through it. So this is what I'm trying to find with the I'm going I'm, I'm going to try and find a select star uh, sorry a no lock pattern in my code. So as we all know a no lock is somewhat undesirable and you can either uh, set a no lock on a you know a query specific level or you can uh, just say set transaction isolation you know read uncommitted or you know that's also possible. But here we are trying to find a no lock hint and what I'm doing is basically I'm passing to it the fragment that is the output of the parser. And then what I do, I define a visitor class for it to find the table hint that is the no lock hint. So I define a class, I give it a name and I say, you know, like I said, it comes from the fragment visitor. So the type of class here is table hint. And then within this, I check if the table hint equals no lock, then please throw a warning that you found a no lock in my code. So that's literally all. It's just a few lines of code. And then I call this using a 
using a shell where I create the parser. The output of the parser is passed to the passed to this function and then you know you call you find the no lock head. These are my other examples, so don't worry about them. And no lock in with pattern. And then I'm going to call it from that where I have a stored procedure with a few no lock hints, you know, embedded in it. So I call it. So it's telling you that it found a no lock hint here, right? Line, column, and the width of the thing. So pretty specific, and it's not going to make mistakes here. It's not going to find um, a no lock that's in a comment or anything like that. So it's actually found it like line 34 here. And then there is another one at 59 down there. If you go look at 59, there is one here. And then there is one at 63 down here. So it's found these three. And you know, it's not much of code. It's just a few lines of code. And what that, that's how it uses the visitor pattern. And you can also do the same thing with a select star. So I show you. Here, except that the visitor class you use is a select star expression. It is not a query. And so if you say select star expression and you say select star found that, that's what it's going to do. So here. So there are a few select stars here in this code. So let's run it. So it's saying select star is found at line. Th There's a select star here. There is one here we can see. And there is. Down there, so it found all of that for us. So if you want to make exceptions, like for example, you don't think this is a problem, so you want to make exceptions to this, then you really can. You have to write additional code to do that. That is to say, you know what you have to do and uh, some amount of uh, .NET programming and such is, is needed for this, but you can do it um, because it allows you to find it very specifically like uh, you may need additional visitor classes to say where this is coming from and such. So back to the slide. OK, so the next demo and the last one I have to show you is to use this thing to fix what it finds. So let's look at an example of that. So find here. I'll also show you the um, I'll show you the reserved words, not uppercase two as an example. This is an example of how you can use tokens. So like I showed you the token here. So for each token in that script token stream, you can check if it's a keyword and then you can check if that keyword is uppercase or not. Really simple code. So if you go back to that example that I had. There are a few here, so if you go and run this. So 50. From there is a from here that is not an uppercase, so it's found that. And then if you go down here, there is an insert that is not an uppercase. So this is the use of tokens. That is you use it to find what uh, you know, what uh, is not an uppercase. And then what was the next one I was looking at is also to how you can fix what you find. So let's look at an example of that. So the most common thing we want to fix without an exception, everybody would agree, is that you don't want any no lock hints in your code and you have a lot of code, let's say. Um, going about fixing no locks really by itself, it doesn't add any business value. So you're unlikely to get uh, you know, somebody is not going to sanction the time you need, you know, to take a few, you know, a week off and just go into code and remove all the no lock ins like, OK, you know, but you would love to have what is an automatic way of doing it. So that's what this helps you with is that 
you know, it allows you an automatic way of doing it. But like I said before, just please remember that it's going to strip your code of comments. But if you're OK with that, then then, you know, then it is really easy to use. So what you have here is. I'm showing you the example that if it's a. That you define the same visitor class that you did. The table reference it is sorry, not it's not the same. It's a table reference and then you go about looking for it in the hints. And if you find that the hint is a no lock. No lock hint like that, then you remove it. You just say table hints dot remove. And we know the other way of defining no locks is again you know, transaction isolation level uh, no read uncommitted. So you can fix that too. You can change it from. Read uncommitted to read committed. Um, you can also remove the statement entirely, but that is a little bit more complicated. I personally don't like to manipulate code at that level. Like I actually pull stuff out and then regenerate it. Uh, it becomes complicated, so I would rather change it to something that is ineffective. So you're making it like read committed, so it becomes ineffective. So I show you how this works. Uh, let's look at a proc with no lock. So I have here a statement. I put both here. Believe me, I have seen places where this this is done too. So I just put it here as a way of demoing it. So I put it as read uncommitted and I also added some no lock ins here. OK, let's let's run this and see how script uh, helps us to fix it. So I'm going to run it. OK, let's go back to that. Are these two things. So it's changed uncommitted to committed. And you go down. Well, that is gone. <laughs> so nice, you know, easy scientific way of doing it. That's an example and you can also you know another example is. Also, if you want to fix index. Look at it. So you have index settings in a very common issue that DBS run into is some some person has created an index with let's say it's mandatory in your world to have data compression on. Um, that's the example I have used and you know people go and create indexes without that setting and you as a DBA you want to know you know you don't want this happening. You want that setting to be introduced. So this is what. You do so you look. See, you look to see if the setting is e if it equals data compression, then you add it. And if this setting is missing, it doesn't exist, right? You add it and you regenerate it. I'm not going through every line of code, but you get the general idea. So I show you how this works. And this, you know, with this, you don't have any issues with comments or anything because it's only a table script. Index before. So it's just a simple create index statement. Uh, you can see here that it does not have any data compression option on it. So I'm going to run it here. It tells you that it didn't have, find any. Data compression missing and it's fixing it. So let's go back and look. Added. So back. OK, those are some examples of what you can use. So what are the pros and cons of fixing? The pros are really scientific. It's not going to mess anything up. Uh, the code to do it is really short, efficient. You don't have to write a lot of code. The cons are that it will reformat your code. And if you are you know, very picky about your own way of formatting, you don't want the script down way of doing it, that can be a problem. And with, with stored procedures, like I said, it removes comments, you know, bummer. I hate it, but you know, right now, unless they fix it, there's no way around it. Um, 
how familiar you are with dotnet programming the fix is not the same for depend for the every problem you have to put some effort into figuring it out but it may be worth figuring out because it it literally does it the right way that when you have large volumes of code so let's look at pros and cons of script dom in general the pros are that it's authentic it's totally scientific it's really easy to deploy and maintain it's just one library um, it's backward compatible and it's asynchronous. It does not need any connection with SQL Server. There are some cons too, um, and define your own rules. Like I said before, a lot of us work in shops that are very custom, and I love I love having my own rules. I love I have a ball with maintaining them. It's so easy, so you can do it. Uh, and cons are that if you have a very large script, and it's really not that bad at all with individual scripts. Some people, if you do crazy things like you want to script out your entire database into one script or do something really, really, really crazy like that, then your memory footprint can be fairly large. And the number for that is like that, like it's a two gigabyte address space for a 15 megabyte file is like a huge file, a script file. So if you want something like that, then it's going to be a problem. And then like it is with, with all other tools of Microsoft, um, the parser is single threaded. So if you want to make it multi-threaded, you may have to write your own clever code around it. Um, it does need some .NET programming man, uh, language, and you have to put effort into figuring out some of these uh, you know, nuanced situations that it handles. So um, I said this before again, and I keep you know harassing them for it. Uh, the formatter needs to retain comments. So that's literally all. Um, these are some useful references that you may find. And I'm going to be giving the same talk at the upcoming PASS Community Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mala. Mala. Uh, uh, will you will be, be in, uh, in Seattle or will you do it virtually? Virtually only. Oh, OK. I so can't afford, afford I an in-person summit yet. And uh, my health is not up, up to <laughs> doing it either. OK. Uh, I I wonder about uh, upvoting on GitHub. Is that just a matter of setting? I will send up you the link you? for that. I will send you my GitHub link. Uh, I have the link. I actually have it up here. But uh, upvoting is that just doing a thumbs up on the original comment on the issue, or or, or how does voting work? No, that's in? just a thumbs up for Microsoft. Okay. It's just a thumbs up. Yeah. Then it's done for me. <laughs> Because I, I agree that that would be a bummer if it's stripped. I'm not a big fan of having comments installed procedures, but when they are there, it's not my job to remove them if someone put them there. So, yeah. so then they're a part of, of it. So, uh, I really I have some ideas already which I would like to to try, like you know, a, building a DAC pack from a database project just. Uh, Check some sanity things like no lock and and indexes. Like, mm -hmm. to just fail the build if you have no lock in the code. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. I get because when once it gets into a build, it's too late to change it anyway. I want the developers to see that mm -hmm. uh, uh, ah okay, I have a no lock and uh, this script changed it for me and. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to have a discussion and tell them why it's not a good idea to have it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, these things spread. I see in in the company I I work with, the option recompile is everywhere, and usually, I mean, option recompile also has its uses. But it's if it's in every stored procedure, we have a problem. Mm. Because we're going to spend all the time compiling statements instead of running them. So. Mm -hmm. No, oh, and it can hit your CPU really hard. Yeah, it's yeah. So it's the um, there are some things that uh, I manually go through sometimes and just look and contact whoever checked in the code last and and talk to them and ask why why it's used. But it would be really nice to just produce a report and say we have 800 recompile option recompiles in our code base. Why do we have that? And and just bring it up on a on an all hands meeting of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Joseph. Can script on be used to add a where clause to all scripts selecting from a specific table? 
Ah, theoretically, theoretically, yes. The the place where I theoretically, yes, you can. The place where I draw the line is with inserting and removing, physically inserting and removing statements. Uh, what I have found easier to do is to modify what is already there. Like a no lock is just removing one part of the statement and um, set read uncommitted to read committed and things like that. You can do it, but the problem is that um, with the generator, it is not very simple to do. Like to add and remove statements is you can do it, but it's a lot of code and um, so far I have not tested that out thoroughly, like whether or not it, it works, it works, you know, in a perfect way. So I would not, what I would recommend instead is to use the tokens and to comment out the code that you don't need. If you have something unnecessary, just add two dashes in front of it and then mm. run it through the parser and see if everything is okay. That is to remove something that you don't need. To add something, I would not recommend using it at all. Uh, that is going a bit too far with it um, to add um, uh, uh, something that is, like I said before, this is for anti-patterns. It's not for introducing a new table or you know anything like that. So that that's going to be a bit outside the scope of what it's supposed to do although you can you can probably manipulate it to do it but i would not recommend that i i guess what i would do maybe would be to to produce a warning or yes yes if, yes. if it's a Absolutely. database project yes. so if that table build. is missing you can produce a warning on on your build and you know reject the build and say you haven't included the right table or you haven't done what is necessary here uh, that absolutely yes mm. so it's um, and i i am usually not a fan of uh, tools that just fixes the code if it yes. has some, some yes code that's what stuff. i said I want, yes. I want yeah. developers to to learn as well. Yeah, so. yeah. So it can, you know, and there are exceptions to it. Like I use it where I am to fix index uh, settings because there's just too many of them and uh, people don't have uh, the desired time uh, sometimes. So you can you can use it for exceptional situations like that. But I completely agree with what you're saying, Magnus, is that they have to know what is wrong and then fix it. Mm -hmm. And who knows, you know, your query may need that table to have some sort of a hint. It may change your execution plan if you add it. All kinds of things are there if you try to force it, you know, automatically. So it's best that uh, there is a developer involved. Yeah, and I think also maybe with data compression and if you want to have a certain fill factor, if there is a certain data type in the index, like if you have GUIDs, you probably don't want 100% fill factor. Maybe the developers, uh, not everyone needs to know it. So that in in those cases, I'm all for just fixing it automatically. But with with the actual code that does things, the business logic, uh, it, it's nice to just give feedback instead. I think. So. Yeah. Uh, your presentation gave me a few things to think about and I think my weekend is ruined because I have to test a few other things. So and that's a really good result. So thank you so much for coming, Mala. Oh, no problem at all. Um...